Okay, good afternoon. Thanks for Sharon and the team for inviting me to speak today and some really fascinating talks, uh, great topics. That was uh, impressive stuff there, the transmedic. We call it the heart in the box. Amazing stuff. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a story about a new device. It'll be new to many of you and I think you'll start to see it come into use in Australia over the coming year or two. And it's probably a little bit more accessible than uh, the stuff you've just seen. I expect you'll probably see it in your, your CAF labs around the country in the not too distant future. I'll talk a little bit about, introduce you to this technology, show you a case that we didn't talk about, its role perhaps in supporting complex coronary intervention. This is a device and uh, it looks pretty impressive and it's high tech, but it's not much more engineering than what goes into your fish tank. You know, if you've got a fish tank at home, there's a little magneto that spins in there, it's called an impeller and it drives uh, fluid forward and that's what this does. The real sort of uh, uh, craft in this is miniaturizing it and putting it into a pigtail catheter, something that we, we're pretty familiar with. We use it in the cath lab every day and, and that's the real genius of this to miniaturize it and allow it to uh, put it into someone's heart. And it, and it works very well because it takes blood out of the left ventricle and pushes it into the aorta. It reduces end diastolic filling pressures, reduces oxygen demand, ox improves oxygen supply by increasing aortic pressures, improving cardiac output and improving blood flow through the heart. So it's a nifty thing and there are several size devices. There's a very small one, a 2.5 litre per minute, so it generates two, a cardiac output of 2.5 litres a minute, uh, impeller 2.5. The CP, which is the most commonly used worldwide by interventionists, because it's still percutaneous and gives you your maximum bang for your buck, it'll put out 3.5, and in some people it'll get up to 4, 4.5 in the right circumstances. It's a 14 French sheet, so it's a big sheet, but it's still something that's achievable by the percutaneous route. When you get up to the impeller 5, this is a surgical type device. Cardiac surgeons put this in after operations, for example, if uh, to support the ventricle. It's 21 French, which is very large, um, and the flow rate up to 5 litres, so that's uh, you know normal cardiac output. And then there's a specifically designed version for the right heart to support um, a failing right heart, and that's the, the RP, which is the right-sided impeller. And it's connected to a controller, which is fairly simple and intuitive to use and I'll show you what that looks like later. This is how the pump works. You can see it spans the aortic valve. The pigtail sits in the left ventricle as you'd expect. Comes around out over the arch and this is the impeller that sits in there. And not much different, like I said, to a, an impeller that sits in your fish tank. And what it does is take blood out of the ventricle and pump it into the aorta through a competent valve. And this is a little wires put into the ventricle. The impeller's brought around the arch and it takes blood out and into the aorta. And that's, that's basically how it works. Um, and of course, blood is sucked in and expelled up in the ascending aorta. Um, it's hemodynamic effects are pretty much as I described, and, and, it, and that's how it works in, in uh, body and in vitro. You can improve cardiac output, and this uh, links to better cardiac, lower cardiac mortality in patients who are at risk. So it reduces wall tension, reduces mechanical work by reducing filling pressures, takes you to a better place on the Starling curve for those of you like flow volume loops, uh, improves coronary perfusion, and overall it acts to sort of rest the heart. And uh, it has a good, good results in the studies that I'll show you. These are, the, these are the agents. And these are the features, so 9 French up to, or 12 French up to 22 French. The catheters are 9 French, but those motor units are the, are the big part of the device. They, these can stay in for four or five days if you need to. Usually the percutaneous device are pulled out at the end of the case, but you can leave them up to five days, uh, four days in the US, five days approved in Europe. These devices, these surgical devices, um, are for much longer duration stays, and there have even been some patients who've had them as uh, medium-term therapies pending transplant by implanting them in the axilla and allowing them to mobilise. Um, so that's a little bit about the actual device. What might be the role of this? How can we use this new technology? Um, what settings are we going to use it? Well, we can clearly use this in for complications of infarction, if there are mechanical complications, pump failure, if the right ventricle fails. In severe heart failure, and non-ischemic cardiomyopathies where the patient's in refractory shock, and maybe it's a bridge to VAD, or maybe it's a bridge to um, a transplant or other. If there's acute cardiac allograft failure, post-transplantation people have used it, 
post-transplant right ventricular failure, that can be common. Um, patients who are slow to wean from cardiopulmonary bypass post-cardiothoracic surgery. They've used it in EP for patients with very bad and refractory arrhythmias like VT storm, and they've used it to support ven um, complex ablations, VT ablations in patients with very bad ventricles who are unstable. Um, it's also widely used, as you'll see, to support very high-risk percutaneous intervention and revascularization. Um, and it's also used to vent as a boutique indication to vent ECMO patients in whom the, the ventricle blows out when they're on ECMO, they get MR, and that can be a very difficult problem to deal with. You can use this device to vent the left ventricle. Um, so it has a number of uses, and how is it actually been used? Uh, well, there's over 50,000 implanted worldwide, and the uses varied from different countries, between countries, depending on the circumstances that you find in countries. For example, in, in France and, and Germany, they do a lot of arterial revascularization. It's most commonly used in acute infarction and shock. In other sites, particularly where there are a lot of vein graft reperfusion, it's used to support high-risk PCI. Um, and, and these countries are obviously um, very close to each other, and you can see there's quite a bit of variation how it's been applied. But the key, key uses worldwide have been to support patients who've had acute myocardial infarction or cardiogenic shock, and patients who are high-risk percutaneous interventions. And we'll talk a bit about that because I'm an interventional cardiologist, and I'll just show you how this has been used in that context. It's been used to support patients with shock and aortic stenosis, um, who are undergoing valvoplasty, <laughs> as I said, EP ablation and cardiomyopathy. We, we, we know there's a need for this sort of device because conventional therapies really don't work very well. Inotropes buy us some time, but there's never been any studies to show that they have a, a big result on uh, mortality for patients. And balloon pumps, you know, we, we hoped that these would be doing exactly what the impeller sort of does, but all the studies have been fairly disappointing, I'm afraid, on the balloon pump front. Um, so there was really a need for something to support the heart and impeller really was aimed at sort of trying to support PCI in complex patients, and we'll talk about that, and uh, to support patients who are in cardiogenic shock for a period to allow them to recover once they've undergone appropriate uh, revascularization. And the first trial that was sort of pitched with this technology and the trial that led to the FDA approving it and it really taking off in the US was the PROTECT-2 trial, which was targeted at those really complex high-risk patients who needed revascularization and who were not um, surgical candidates really. And they wanted to see uh, how would the impeller go head to head with a balloon pump, which was the uh, standard of care at the time. And they followed these patients up to see what kind of results they'd get. So these patients were randomized and they were a high risk group, you know, high STS mortality risk for surgery, rejected for surgery, a lot of comorbidities. A lot of them had had previous revascularization or bypass. And um, what they found is that the impeller was much better than a balloon pump at reducing the adverse event rate. When you followed these out to 90 days, um, these patients did um, much better. Uh, the, the, the lines clearly <coughs> diverged. It was a small study hypothesis generating, but there was clearly an advantage to impeller, and that persisted out to, to 90 days, three months. And, you know, these new technologies are all expensive and a cost analysis was done on this. It is an expensive study, um, an expensive device. Um, and these are US data at the time, costing around 40000 But in saving uh, those patients, it certainly seemed to pay for itself. And it's a Tavi-esque and it's sort of cost impact. So it's something that we need to target to a, a population who are going to get most benefit and use it wisely. But the study front, but the conclusions from PROTECT2 was that it provided very good hemodynamic support for this patient group and certainly did better than a balloon pump. In parallel to this, if you've been following the interventional literature over the last few years, you would have heard a lot about chips. Chips, chips, what, what, what are they talking about? Uh, it's not our favourite food, uh, heart-friendly chips, and it's not bad movies that Greg likes to watch on the weekends. Uh, it's really about a complex, high-risk uh, patients who are indicated for intervention. And this concept has really come out in the last few years, and I'll try and explain why. And it's tied to developments and improvements in hemodynamic left ventricular support and in the development of more advanced techniques for cardiac intervention. So these are patients who are complex, they're high-risk, 
the, the, the procedure is indicated, it's an interventional procedure uh, in this patient group. And this is because really the times have changed, that's me when I was a registrar, and the 1990s, that's what's happened to our patients. We've all become older, fatter, uh, our disease is complex, the disease is calcified, there's frequently chronic total occlusions, diabetes is common, obesity, cognitive impairment, heart failure epidemic, and renal disease and other epidemics. So that's, that's how the times have changed. And so we really need to address that that's what our patients are like these days. Uh, they're older, they've got heart failure, and they've got complex disease. And these patients are often the patients that we run a mile from. They're not revascularized the way they perhaps should be, particularly if, for example, this is a study of ACS patients. Those sort of patients who perhaps would benefit the most with the highest risk are the ones that intervention is most avoided in. Similarly, in patients with heart failure, if you look at large studies, they're again patients in whom therapy is avoided. And if you look at the HEFPEP population that we heard about earlier, many of them have got underlying coronary disease in these surveys and uh, very few of them actually been revascularized. So these patients, we, we go away from them because the risks of intervention are high. The risk from their disease is high, but the risk for the procedure is high. Surgeons will often reject them and traditionally interventions have, interventionists have also rejected them. So let's see one of these patients and see what kind of difference this sort of technology can make. Um, this is the first Impella CP case in Australia we did last year. This is the, the start of our program and this was truly a chip patient. This is an 80, 80 odd year old female who had previous bypass many years ago, over 10 years ago. She had vein grafts, the fact that she had the standard sort of three corner cabbage elema, a vein graft to the circle and a vein graft to the right, presented with a non stemmy with global ST elevation and gross hemodynamic instability. Um, now, this is the problem we've got. We've got a lemur that's not functioning. You've got a, a subclavian that's uh, stenosed in any case. Um, we've gone down and had a look. That's a lemur. Probably never worked. We've had a look at a native disease. You've got severe osteostenosis of the uh, left main. You've got very high-grade complex calcified LADs and, and circ disease, and you've got a chronic total occlusion of the right coronary. This is nasty stuff, and with these injections, a patient gets chest pain, ST segments drop, uh, really difficult sort of thing to fix, and you can see it's all hanging from a thread, really. Um, and has she got a graft? Well, the vein graft to the right has gone down. Let's see if the circ is open. Yes, that's very bad. It's a high-grade stenosis. Thanks for Rustam uh, for his... Uh, for that comment, and this is the right coronary. It's uh, diffusely diseased and it's, it's uh, re canalized from the left. This is a vein graft, an ugly vein graft that's over 10 years old. It's complex disease, and the rest of the heart is hanging from a thread as well. So, you know, this is a problem, and we do see an increasing number of these post bypass surgery, uh, the Melbourne group, arterial revascularization, but more broadly, it's often vein grafts and they fail and uh, they become disease or occluded. We see these, this patient group who are elderly, often frequently, and in studies about 40% of the time, uh, as uh, coming to complex percutaneous intervention. So this is this patient. What can we do for something quite severe as this? Most interventionists would reject this for intervention. The moment you sort of start to occlude one of these vessels, you're gonna fall into a massive hemodynamic hole, and the procedure becomes very high risk. So she was our first patient that we uh, used in Pella to support complex um, cardiac intervention. So uh, this was her vasculature, so not the best, but still acceptable for uh, Impella, which is a 14 French sheath. Um, so we've carefully studied her groin. If you look further up, there's even more surprises, and that's her uh, one of these EVARs. They're very pretty devices, as you can see, and we've had to negotiate that as well for her. But it's still possible. We, we considered other options, auxiliary or transcable. These are new techniques. Uh, but ultimately, um, we were able to take this device up the leg. She fit, she's a typical chip patient that I talked about earlier. Three vessel disease, poor left ventricular function, multiple comorbidities, post cardiac surgery with surgical turn downs. And when we talk about these chip patients, they are patients who are defined by their comorbidities, by their complex coronary anatomy, and by their hemodynamic and ventricular dysfunction. So back to the cath lab with this lady, we, I think vascular access is 
has to be done very carefully to minimise vascular complications. So we've come up from the contralateral side and done uh, angiography guided puncture and use ultrasound as well in this case. It's a bit messy, but that's the uh, that's what the groins look like in this lady. And uh, then we've crossed into the ventricle, and then we use a, a wire that comes in the kit to place the impeller device. So that's gone into the ventricle there. And this is the device going up, and it goes up. It's a it, the body of it's bulky, but the, the tip of it's just like a pigtail, and it's gone through a fourteen French peel away sheath there. And this is the device going up over the arch in real time. It slides around quite nicely uh, into the ventricle and pull back the wire and leave the device behind. And then you connect it up to the machine. Now, just so you know where this is sitting, this is obviously the inlet in the ventricle. It's spanning at the elbow, the aortic valve, and then the ascending uh, aorta is the motor outlet unit, which is driving the uh, cardiac output. And then we're able to get on with what is a very complex intervention. So. We start with the vein graft first. That's we have to put a embolization protection device down. This was a tricky to wire and difficult case, but a, 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 a stent goes in and we get a, a nice result on that. And then we're able to turn our attention to this, which is critical left main stenosis, incredibly uh, calcified and complex uh, left anterior descending disease. All the time, the patient's stable, got a nice blood pressure, and is free of ischemia. Um, to enable you to do these interventions, we had to do a rotor burr on this case. If any of you out there know that, that can generate a lot of ischemia. It's a complex device, but it's got a diamond tip burr to clear out the calcium. So these are complex interventions, hence the, the, chip, the chip name. And after three stents to reconstruct the LAD, the LAD looks very nice too. So, um, And then... Rustin wanted to do the CTO to the right, but uh, it was very late in the day and I thought we should just finish it there. But you could continue to go on and, and intervene on the right if you wanted to. Um, this is removal of the impeller. Just comes out, pull it out through the sheet. Now you can pre, we pre-close the groin with proglides uh, and then we pull them tight when we remove the sheet. We've taken a shot of the groin afterwards. So, uh, and we're happy. Good job. Uh, and the patient's been stable throughout, no chest pain, blood pressure's good, and goes back to coronary care after. So that's, that's how Impella can be introduced in the lab, and I suspect that's how it may uh, come to be introduced over the next year or two um, to deal with this uh, epidemic of older, complex chip-style patients. Um, there's a growing population of these patients with poor ejection fractions, elderly, advanced heart failure and coronary disease, and uh, they're not good candidates for surgery. I mean, uh, they, they, even if you get them through the operation, their recovery is prolonged and the opportunity costs are significant. Uh, if you can manage them percutaneously, it's a, it's a much better proposition. And so these patients are clearly a goal, uh, a group whom, whom we can target with the uh, arrival of technologies such as this, and these patients have all these sort, sorts of comorbidities that make them very unattractive candidates uh, for surgery. Um, and so patients who have heart failure and angina who come into that uh, higher risk surgical group are ideal, and these are sort of suggestions about who you might select for this technology. Um, but they're the patients I've just described to you. And the results with Impella in terms of being able to get them through the procedure and into recovery are, are much better than any other therapies that we have at the moment. One of the interesting benefits of this technology is because the cardiac output increases, you see their renal function improve. And this lady who had renal impairment, the next day her creatinine was much better. Uh, and, you know, where, where renal um, contrast nephropathy is a concern, I think there's even a, an advantage with the Impella in that context. Um, and so people have developed standardised algorithms to enable people to select. We've sat this device with our TAVI team, so we have criteria for which patients might be selected for the device. We have a workup and we have a presentation at a multidisciplinary group to select, similar to what we did with TAVI, who might be the right candidates to go ahead for the technology because they're complex, they're elderly, they're high risk and it's expensive, just like TAVI. So we've sat that with our TAVI group to select these patients out. And like I said, it's that high-risk surgical group who are 
high risk clinically and then anatomically, it might be better for use of this technology. And those are sort of FDA, AHA guidelines. And so we have a algorithm and a heart team assessment like we do for TAVI for these patients. There are complications of the technology that we need to be aware of. Access bleeding, obviously, at 14 French G. Access site infection, which it needs to be considered and uh, avoided at all costs. Limb ischemia is possible. Hemolysis, people often ask about it, can occur, but it has been uncommon in the PCI series and obviously it is somewhat related to the duration that it's in. And of course, stroke, these patients are anticoagulated while the device is in. Here's some suggestions about setting up an impeller program. Start with these elective high-risk cases. Have a team, a heart team, to select your patients. Identify people who can be specialists and local resources, technical <laughs> specialists for the console. Um, and refrain from trying to use this as a salvage device in the patient who's dying, so we just put an impeller in. That's a bad way to start a program. Start with the elective patients in whom everything is planned and you have a good chance of a good outcome and uh, evaluate after your first 10 cases for those of you who are thinking about starting a program. So in conclusion, this is an interesting new technology. I think you're gonna see it more and more in your cath labs and programs over the next year or so. I think it's got multiple uses, but one of the key uses for the interventionist is gonna be in supporting these high risk indicated uh, procedures. And there are many benefits, I think, from the, the device. And there are some clinical guidelines and FDA approval that come out of the, particularly the US and Europe. And so uh, I'll leave it there and open up to discussion if we have any time left. Thank you.